Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Tonight I would like to share with you an interview I did with renowned ufologist Graham Allen. Graham contacted me back in March of 2022 as he's an avid investigator who lives close to the notorious Canic Chase and he's well known for his work in the field of the strange and the unexplained. Sadly, it took me until Feb of 2023 to finally sit down and record an interview with Graham about his research as a whole and also share some of the many cases he has worked on over the decades. Graham is the founder of the Staffordshire UFO Group, which was started in 1995 in order to investigate UFO cases across the Midlands. Graham started the group after his own experience with triangular craft many years ago. One event where he witnessed a UFO took place in Adelaide in Australia and the second event happened close to Canic Chase. The Staffordshire UFO group produced a full-length professional documentary on flying triangular shaped craft in 2004. It was awarded an EB at the 2005 Lachlan Nevada International UFO Congress Conference. This documentary contains the reports of well-documented events from the Staffordshire area. Graham has kindly shared a link to this documentary and you'll find it in the information below, along with Graham's contact email. I would strongly suggest contacting him if you've had an experience on Canet Chase, as Graham is a huge source of information when it comes to the area. I'd like to give you a quick rundown on the events Graham shared with me during our conversation and then you'll hear the audio interview between myself and Graham. So on my birthday on the 15th of the 3rd, Graham contacted me and he said, Hi Deborah, just a quick message. A friend of mine who lives in Adelaide, Australia has recently told me about your research and interest in the Yowie out there. I lived out in Australia many years ago and I moved there as a young boy with my family. I now live here in the UK on the edge of the renowned Canic Chase and I investigate and look for strange activity. I ran the Staffordshire UFO group many years ago and I'm currently carrying out research on a few notorious sites. I was in contact with Graham again on the 8th of April 2022 and he said, at 11pm last night I had a past work colleague who's also a town planner message me. He was asking if I knew a cryptozoologist as he believed he'd just witnessed a black panther on the chase. I didn't get back to him straight away, but I just called him to get details and he said, I had the weirdest experience last night coming home from work. I think with an animal that was bearing down on me from behind in the undergrowth. I was walking back from the Trent Valley station at the time this happened. I thought you might know someone doing research in that area and my story could help them build a bigger picture. The exact details, Deb, are it happened at 25 past nine on the 8th of April 2002. The conditions were cool with a little bit of light rain and this happened at Rugeley Bypass near the old railway bridge. The witness report came from a gentleman called Matt and he said he'd walked with a friend to see him off at Rugeley Trent Valley Station, walking back home along the bypass at about 24 minutes past nine, he heard a breathing, growling noise coming from behind him, which got closer and louder until he could hear footsteps in the undergrowth and the leaves to the point that he thought whatever it was was about to pounce on him. He turned around quickly, threw his arms in the air and shouted, only to see a glimpse of something right behind him that spun around and darted into the bushes. He said you could see the bushes shake. He was panicked and he rang his wife at 25 past nine to come and pick him up. He is convinced it was a black panther whose territory is close to the River Trent. When his wife picked him up, he tried to explain the breathing or growl that he heard, which wasn't like that of a dog. She found a panther breathing on YouTube and played it to him. And he was even more shaken on hearing that. He hopes it will be a useful record and he wants me to pass it on to you, Deb. The strange thing is, I've not had anything to do with any of this sort of stuff for years now. And within a couple of weeks of contacting you, I've had a UFO report on Thursday the 7th, a Blackfoot Panther report on the 8th. 
And if I didn't know any better, I suspect something or someone was trying to tell me something. Graham and I chatted again when he sent in a new case that he's working on and we arranged to set up the interview. And this was a bear-like figure that was spotted in October 2022, so quite recently. And he said, back in October, I got a call from a local couple very early one weekend morning. The lady of the house had been woken up by the outside security light coming on about 4.30 a.m. She decided to get up and investigate and she went out of the back window and saw a large dark figure moving around on the back lawn. She then went to wake up her husband and he opened the back door and proceeded out towards what they both described as a bear-like figure. Being in their 80s, the couple of course were concerned and confused at what they were seeing. The figure was hunched over a fairy ring of mushrooms and as the husband walked forward and approached it to confront and hit it, the security light came on and the figure vanished immediately, leaving no trace. Graham said, I did go around to their home after the call and they were both insistent on what they'd just happened. They were so concerned they even got me to take photographs of what they felt was a footprint. They did ring the police who have supplied them with a security camera and advise them on safety issues. Now let's listen to the interview with myself and Graham. Can I have a look at this? Anyway, uh, there were the two, two lights going across the county chase and they were sort of tumbling over one another. So it was, well, that's odd, you know. Mm. That's not normal, that's not normal. Anyway, we watched these two lights and so I disappeared towards the direction of Stafford, sort of by Green Tower, tower and, and sort of then on towards Stafford. Anyway, we sort of lost sight of them and gave up. And then uh, 10 to 10, I think it was, and these two lights were coming towards us from the direction of Stafford. So we all sort of gathered again watching these two lights. Mm. Made, another two, made another two triangular shaped objects as they got closer. Um, my mother went into the house, rushed in for camera, came out, but there was no film in it. Right. And that was the days before, the days before yeah. of our phones, so you didn't just pick your phone up and take a picture, but these two things that went over were silent, two triangular shaped objects, one directly behind the other, really looking quite low. Mm -hmm. And really that's one of the reasons I got into the UFO subject, because the MP for Stafford at the time, Bill Cash, probably heard the name Bill Cash, he's still an MP, uh, took it up um, in the in the Commons, right. the Defence Minister at oh. the time, and they said it was but busy traffic into Birmingham Airport, well, I know it wasn't, yeah. it certainly wasn't going towards Birmingham. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's where it started for you? <laughs> yes and no. Right. Um, it's what kicked it back, I think, into, into touch, because I had uh, sightings when I was younger, about the age, I think it was 13, mm. or around about 13, in this country, in England. And I used to live in Australia as well. We moved to Australia when I was 13. Right. And um, we lived in a place called Adelaide, which is in South Australia. My uncle lived 150 miles north of Adelaide in the, in the outback, a place called Yongle. And uh, it, it used to appear on the weather at the time in Australia because it was always the hottest and driest place in South Australia. So it always featured in weather. It's been 45 degrees in Yongala today. Yeah. Anyway, we used to visit my uncle and it was in the middle of nowhere. A bit like a Wild West type town. You've got a post office come hotel with hitching posts for horses outside and, and a pub next door, which was a hotel as well and that yeah. was about it that was amazing of course uh, my uncle had i got those six kids and they made up half the population of the local school <laughs> and it shows you how sparse it was yeah and anyway uh, one night we we were they got a pet kangaroo so we were sort of playing with a kangaroo out the, out the back and it's pitch black and um, running around just with the one sort of light light on the, on the back of the house and all of a sudden we, we all pretty much saw it, it looked like a shooting star. Yep. Wow, look! And the shooting star came out and then leveled off and slowed down. Well, it then stopped and for 
greenish coloured objects came out of the bottom and went in different directions across the sky. Yeah. So we, we stood there watching that and my mum and dad and my uncle and aunt had gone to this local pub, this bar, probably the only ones in there I reckon, that um, came back and what are you doing? I was well, watching this star, it well, looked like a star, yeah. watching this star which had come down and stopped. And uh, anyway, uh, my uncle looked at it and said, oh, it is just a star. And we said, no, no, things came out the bottom of it. And the mum and dad and the aunt stood there, and the uncle wasn't too fussed. And uh, of course, then these four lights came back across the sky from different directions and went to where this star was, this light. Mm. And it, they all disappeared in its vicinity. You can't say they went inside, but yeah. I imagine that was the sort of thing that happened. And it just then just shot off fast, really fast. So I think that was probably my first kind of brush with anything that I would say was UFO related. And then I sort of a few things like, and you always hear stories of, of things, but uh, that really back in 1973-ish, and it was 1988, I think, when the two triangular shot objects went over, over this area. So that got me into the UFO subject, and yeah. I, I'd say really. And then later on, the staff to UFO got formed, and uh, then we had the likes of Mick Redfern, who was one mm. of our members, uh, and Robbie Graham. You might have heard of his name, yeah. sort of quite uh, infamous now, I think, in the UFO field. Um, so you know, we spawned a few sort of investigators, but Mick Mick Redfern was mm. the one who went around sort of investigating sort of cryptozoology yes. side things with Bigfoot and things on the can of chase and I really didn't take a lot of notice of that of that to be yes. quite honest because I thought well that's, that's a, aside from the UFO subject but what I will say is that those witness reports of those sorts of things coincided with witness reports of UFOs so I got I got a brush with the Black Panther yeah. side of things and investigated that. And those are occurring as well with, in coincidence yeah. with UFO sightings. So I investigated a few of those and got one of the leading experts from down south up here investigating released black cats, but he couldn't find any evidence. And he said, well, there would be signs of a big cat. But the stories from local people, there was a farmer sat in his tractor plowing his field and this cat walked in front of the tractor and he was absolutely terrified mm. to get out of his tractor. And you think, well, farmers don't normally come up with stories yeah. like that. And, you know, so to me, it must have been a big, big cat, but no. So what, what I was told at the time by this expert, he'd been up and down the country investigating Black mm. cats, and he certainly believes, you know, that there are those that have been released into the wild because people can't keep them, or the, mm. the legislation, and one thing or another. But there was two distinct cases yeah. to come across, and one was that they are actual big black cats, panthers, or mm. alike, and the other is that these things walk in front of people, turn in car headlights, and got red glowing eyes, yeah. and those are the ones that he says he cannot find an explanation for or any evidence of a, a black cat. So I think I started to, to, to become a bit more open to the fact that the UFO phenomenon isn't just... I take a lot of big cat reports on the chase, but we also get those reports of the red-eyed thing. And that seems not only with the, the black cats. I mean, I've, I've read enough as well in the past to... to you know, since really uh, sort of getting involved in that, about other sightings of black dogs and things like that. And uh, there's certainly reports from the past of, of black dogs, and that seems mm. very similar to these big black cats or black panthers. Um, I believe that I encountered one one night, and I've been to my mother's, which is local. So it's, uh, I was sort of pulling away from my mother's house, and a car had just come past me and had gone ahead. So I, I was then started following this car mm. and it stopped and I could see why it had stopped. There was this big black, what looked like a cat, but big 
certainly wasn't a small cat, it was a big cat. And it did what I just said to the, the farmer, turned and looked. You know, mm. I could see its face turned towards the car. I could see, couldn't see where it got red eyes. But it then sort of moved, stopped, then carried on walking to the left. Mm. And another car moved on. And I thought, I've just seen that Black Panther, whatever it was. So yeah. I was then alerted to the, to the fact that there was perhaps something as well, you know, on the kind of chase to investigate. That's really why um, I sort of became more interested in the other side of the, the UFO subject. And there were then mutilations on the kind of chase of deer. Mm. There was a, a donkey or a, an ass or, or whatever. Um, and it had got its uh, throat cut and it had been dragged across the field. And I asked this investigator, I said, well, could a panther drag a donkey across the field? He said, no, it wouldn't be strong enough to do that. Mm. Plus, they wouldn't go for anything that big. They go for rabbits, small prey. Yeah. They can kill quickly, easily. They're then sort of going to sharpen the claws of the local or nearest tree, that sort of thing. Yeah. So there's all those evidence that you would you would look for for signs of a big, big cat. So I became more and more convinced that these black cats are not something physical around here. It's connected with the with the UFO subject. Now I've not living on the chase all my life, I've not heard of hairy hairy men or, mm -hmm. or, or it was at this point that Graham shared a report with me that is very, very recent. So I have redacted some of the information so that we can keep it secret. But I have added in all of the relevant details. He had a phone call from a local couple who'd seen something in their garden and he went up to investigate the next day. We start with Graham explaining to me that the lady's a very light sleeper and she does get up several times within the night. She'll get up several times in the night anyway. And uh, anyway, the security light had come out the back, so she went into the into the kitchen bungalow, so she went from the bedroom to the kitchen and looked out the back window. And she could see a, a, a black figure moving backwards and forwards on the lawn. So, so at that point, she went back and woke up her husband he came out, looked out the window and saw the same thing as her. Thinking that it was some kind of a prowler or something like that, he actually went out to confront it. He looked out the window, saw this figure, right, and he went out the back door to confront and took several steps towards it and could see it in front of him. And it was, he said, described it like a big bear haunched over, a fairy ring or a mushroom. Right. And... Uh, of course, as he sort of walked past the security light, came on, and this thing was in front of him, like he said, only feet away, and he just vanished. Now, so he was looking at places where they could have got in, mm. out, um, but he, 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 he was absolutely bemused at the fact that he was approaching this thing, ready to grab it, type yeah. of thing, and he just vanished. So, anyway, he went about removing the fairy ring. No, they won't be coming back tonight and get rid of the mushrooms. He got me up the garden, he says, what, what's this? He says, what's what's this? A print, look. He said, somebody, something's been here, look. And, and of course, there was no way out the garden, only by hedges, holly and trees. And, um, and so he got me to take a photograph of this, and I thought, oh, I can't see that that's a print. Anyway, I sent it to, to Mandy in Australia. Mm -hmm. And... She said, well, it does look like a print to me. And she said, oh, I've, I've heard Deborah on mm. a podcast the other day. And she, so she sent it to me, talking about the hairy man. And I thought, well, perhaps I ought to let Deborah know about yeah. this. Cause I'm just wondering, because obviously I don't know the area. So when we're speaking privately, me and you later... Yeah. I'll have a, if you can let me know the area, I'll have a look and see if I've got anything that's in my private notes. Um, because if it's one on one of the ley lines or something like that, Graham? It is. It is on a ley line. Right. Um, it's on one of the, the major ley lines. One of the... Oh, I'm terrible sometimes with the names of these things, but there's the one that goes up to the big spine. Uh, but anyway, it, it passes through this area and shoves the hall and, and, and that way on. Well, 
they they live in a, an area and Ooh. I was a, live, live very close as well to it's called Etching Hill. Right. And uh, it's there was somebody who wrote some history article about it in um, in the past was it being a druidic site. Mm. And it certainly connected with other things in the area. And uh, I mean that is the area where I was up that hill when I saw the, the triangular thing that I saw in 1989, so that's a separate event. It connects. Um, it connects, yeah, doesn't so, it? Yeah, to that area. It, it connects, I, though, doesn't it? I think most definitely. I used to do talks and I had to do the slideshow, and there's a, there's a church at the bottom of the hill. Mm. It's called the Church of the Holy Spirit. But the vicar that was there... Um, he once did a, a Christmas uh, service, and on the front of the on the front of the pamphlet that he put out for the Christmas service, he'd got the three wise men and the manger with Jesus and all that, and a Ooh. UFO oh. over the top of the you know the little inn, and with a beam with a beam coming down. Anyway, he was criticised for this by Ooh. local people, and he was asked why he, why he'd done it. Mm. And uh, he, he went and said, well, Etchin Hill is the occult capital of Britain. Right. Uh, anyway, I think he lost his job or oh. uh, was moved on. Um, but I've still got, still got those bits and pieces, and it was mm. certainly in the paper at the time, and that would have been the 1990s. But the, the sighting that I had in 1989 was, I think it was the first or second of October, to lose track sometimes of things. Well, I think I think it was the first. And anyway, I'd gone up to the top of Etchin Hill at just before seven o'clock. Now at that time it's just going dusk, just before mm. well, sun setting at that at that time and sort of going dark ish. And I'd gone up with the dog and two kids at the time and mm. uh they were up there running around the hill with the, with the dog and uh, I saw this bright orange, what looked like a spark, shoot across the sky um, from the direction of Stafford. Mm. Uh, and there was a light and anyway, it disappeared where this light was. So not dissimilar to what we saw in Australia, but this was an orange light. The light was getting closer and closer and then became two lights and I'm thinking, it's an airplane. Anyway, uh, this was two minutes to seven at, at that point because mm. I made a note of the time and uh, I called the two kids. I said, oh, come up here, can I look at this? And uh, they came up and uh, anyway, this thing came over us and it was massive, massive triangular shape, but not an equilateral triangle. It was your cone shape or isosceles triangle, mm. isn't it? Um, we were covered in lights and they were all flashing from the front to the back in a sequence in rows of lights wow. and uh, at the back there was like an orange rectangular section which looked like an open bay that's all I can say, it looked like an open bay and it was so close you thought well if somebody was looking out over the like, yeah. you know, bay you'd have been able to see them wave anyway it, it moved it turned, but not on it, not a tilt turn like a plane. It turned on its axis type of thing in a almost like if you get a, uh, your flat hand and just turn it in the air, it turned like that. Mm. And it went over Rugeley Power Station. Now, to me, it dwarfed the, the cooling tower. So that gives the size of how big it was. Wow. Anyway, I thought, I'm watching this and thinking, Everybody in Rugeley has got to have seen this. They can't miss it. So looking up in the sky, they've got to have seen this. Mm. So I came back down the hill with the kids, and when they got home, I got them to draw what they saw, just so as I thought, well, if they draw the same thing yes. as what I saw, you know, they saw the same thing, kind of thing and they did. Uh, the daughter, the one daughter, she was uh, she nine at the time, she drew what looked like a, a bunch of grapes, which is good enough because that's what she saw a triangular shape mm. with, all, with all lights on it yep. and uh, anyway uh, at the time I was working for somebody and the following day I told them about it 
And she, she rang me the following week. She said, oh, Graham, that thing you told me about last week, she said, have you seen the Stafford newsletter? And I said, no. She said, well, you ought to look at it. Anyway, she cut the article out and I, she, I went around and collected it. Mm. And the article was of this orange ball of light that was witnessed in Stafford at low level sort of hovering above a road which was about the size of a minivan right so anyway she said this thing shot up in the air and shot towards the can of chase mm -hmm. well that would have and that was at the same time that i saw this yeah. orange ball of light come from Stafford. so to me that was evidence validation was evidence to me yeah that somebody else had witnessed the orange ball of light but nobody else came forward and saw the triangular thing. So, you know, over the over time with the UFO subject and investigating itself, I've found this so often. You can have a group of witnesses see something yeah. absolutely fantastic, and then people not too far away see absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's not that's not dissimilar either to these Black Panther sightings and whatever. You cats as it were but mm. because i had that tie in myself and because of, you know to me the farmer which i know the field and don't necessarily know the farmer or knew the farmer at the time but you know he wasn't the type to sort of say you know maybe so because farmers don't like losing time when they do uh, <laughs> get the crops in you know mm. and just keep on going until there's no light left and so to be terrified, stuck in his cab type thing is, uh, you know, a bit unusual in, in itself. But he was quite convinced that he'd, he'd seen a cat and was adamant that, you know, if, if we went round there, we must be able to find evidence. And there was nothing, so... Mm. Yeah. It doesn't surprise uh, me. It doesn't surprise me that, that, that it's massive, the chase, isn't it? It's huge. Yeah, it's sort of 17,000 17, acres. Mm. Um, it, I mean, I've, I've, I mean I'm, I think I might have told you this, I've done around with Tampana, so I'm involved with sort of minerals and that sort of thing, mm. and quarries and, well, all sorts of rebuildings as well, and sort of major infrastructure that um, part of my uh, sort of knowledge is geology as well. And so I've sort of looked into the background and history of the Cannot Chase, and uh, it's it's quite it's quite unusual, really, because there's sand and gravel deposits which are at a, a lower level between a, a harder rock mm. cap, you know, so coal mines as well. So they they flooded, but that was because they were underneath the the older rock. Yeah. The, the yeah. younger deposits, coal, is underneath the older rock. So at, at some point in the past, there had been earthquakes which have pushed the hard rock layers up and mm. whatever, but then we've got glacial activity that's brought mudstones and everything else down from the north. So we we not only live on a, uh, a ley line, with major ley line, mm -hmm. But we also leave, uh, live on a geological fault line as well. So that could have been, yeah. We've got sand and gravel. The other mm. side's uh, mudstone, so you've got stoke on Trent, you've got the clays and, mm. and that sort of thing. But um, I mean, I've spoken with um, people who write reports on geology for the government and, and said, well, we're a geological fault cause tectonic activity, like yeah. electrical activity in the ground. And, it wouldn't and doesn't. So you can't put it down to a, a geological fault. No. But the ley line is still something that, you know, hold as a, a possibility to have a connection. It's not just Canic Chase. It goes out past the chase, all of the activity that goes on. And I think yeah. Canic yeah. Chase is kind of the centre of it. I don't know if it's... I believe it's well, the ley, and I wonder why they built Castle Ring there all those years ago. Was it because of delay energy, maybe? Well, here's here's another little story then about Castle Ring, and this mm. goes back to the geology. Um, the the glacial flows that came down from the north, mm. and there's a place, there's a, an area on the kind of chase, which your friends will know that you're talking about, called the glacial boulder. Now, that was brought down in the glacial flows, mm. and this 
boulder, granite boulder, could be from sort of Scotland, it could be further further north towards Norway. But, you know, it, it, there are these glacial boulders across the country that were dragged down with ice flow as mm. well. The ice flow came effectively to form the can of chase on a high plateau. Yeah. So the, the glacier pushed mud stones and, and, and everything else ahead of it and where it stopped and retreated it just left this effectively massive cliff. Yes. Mm. So Castle Ring is is the high point where the glacial flow stopped. Now what you've got at Castle Ring is something unique because what it did was push these mudstones up. Mm -hmm. So that Castle Ring, with it being mud underneath, there's water, standing water around Castle Ring. Then there is a pool and the entrance if you go to Castle Ring. Right. And so it had, it had always got water. Mm -hmm. So it was a good place defend, to defend with yes. a source of water, and you don't get sources of water at high level. Yeah, you know, I get you. Yeah. Yeah. Rivers and stuff. So it was a, a place that they could have a, a build as a defensive um, uh, ring, if you like, yeah. with settlement inside and bring all the local farmers in for the winter. And they would then work the fields in the summer months. But um, there's some other stories I can tell you about that, but um, I don't. I don't think as you're taping it on college at Liberty. So it, there were sort of uh, tribes that lived around here, and uh, it was, um, I'm probably safe to say that uh, it was a belief that uh, an important chieftain uh, was based uh, at, at Castle Ring, but uh, probably all I can really say on that one. Um, so there is sort of a lot of past activity, but yeah, going back to Castle Ring, mm -hmm. never ever a temple, if you like, within the ring. ring because yeah. the belief at that time was that the, the god Canunos dwelt in the forest. Well, the forest that, that grew up uh, was a, a general oak forest. Mm -hmm. It was originally an oak forest, the kind of chase. It's not now. But um, it was later sort of then a royal forest right. king could hunt in. Mm -hmm. And when uh, the forester, the chief king forester, could stand on a fallen tree stump and see within his sight three other trees that had fallen, I think it was three, mm. then it wasn't good enough to be, be called a, a king forest. Right. So it then gets demoted to a chase. Right, so yeah. That's where the name Can it chase? chase comes from, Can it Chase. It, mm. It's a, a defunct royal forest, but effectively now it's a commercial forest for uh, the pine tree. And whether or not the god of the forest is something which led to like, stories of my grandmother telling me, beware of the bogeyman, don't go into the woods, because she lived right on the Can it Chase. Right. We live on the edge, but not, mm. not in it. It's only five minutes walk up the road with the dog, but um, uh, yeah, there's certainly been stories in the past. But and she she knew some of the Italian prisoners of war because you were talking about those, like right? yeah, yeah, the the, the prisoners, yeah, they were too scared yeah. to escape. Yeah, in actual fact, we um, many years ago, when was it day nineteen? No, it was two. Just after the year 2000, I think I produced it in 2001, 2002. Mm. I produced a, a documentary um, with an ex BBC uh, presenter. Mm. He, did the, he did the presenting and the narration uh, about the triangular sightings we had. Mm. And the, the, some of the filming was done on him of his back garden. So at that time, because they were all witnesses to it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they were open to that. They did they did that. And uh, I took the documentary out to America to uh, mm. the Lost in UFO conference and it won a, what they call an EB award, Extrabiological, right. Extrabiological Entity Award um, in 2003. 
I still, I still get asked for copies of the documentary. So mm. uh, if ever you want one, just let me know. Well, I will. I'd love to. I'll put, a, I'll put a link in there in the description when I put the video out, so people can go across and have a look at it. It's called Can I Chase UFO Hotspot, and it was primarily to do with the two triangular sightings, mm. which I investigated and got the defence, um, not minister, but the um, um, Lord Hill Norton. Mm. Um, the defence chief, basically, of the armed forces, who um, provided comment for the documentary, Graham Bird, so, and, and various others. Um, so I managed to get hold of Ministry of Defence reports, which showed, you know, police involvement, um, air traffic uh, involvement, uh, really? and even the Ministry of Defence's involvement in those two triangular sightings in 88. So it so much as proved that there was a case, mm -hmm. but there was no answer yes. in the end, you know. So um, Bill Cash declined to be interviewed, the MP. Um, and Roger Freeman, the Defence Minister, declined to, to speak, although it was the Defence Minister, Roger Freeman, that stood up in the House mm -hmm. and said it was busy air traffic into Birmingham Airport. So I've done me, I've done me a fair, fair, fair bit of investigation in in the past and mm -hmm. the documentary, I think, was my way of putting forward yes. what you know, the UFO subject was about and you know, prove, showing the evidence and then sort of leaving it at that. But uh, I've entered the pretty much came out of the, the subject mm. for a good 20, 20 years or more, in 2003, 2023 now, so yeah, about 20 years, so I've not really had anything mm. much to do with it, apart from the last year or so. You know, I noticed you said to me that you didn't have much happen, and then you got in touch with me, and yeah. lots of things <laughs> happened all at once. I did, because I've got a colleague who's the, uh, a fellow sort of planner mm -hmm. and uh, he, he's sort of very serious very down to earth and he'd, he'd been to um, drop a friend or walk up with a friend back to Rugeley railway station mm -hmm. so he was coming back and I think I sent you all the details yeah. and he was in a he was a bit shaken really when he was telling me that um, he rang me urgent and I, I actually didn't answer the phone so he left a message mm. saying Graham can you ring me back urgently mm. so when I rang him back he, he told me this story of it sort of been feeling that he had been was being followed and then he could hear rustling in the, mm. the hedge like in the leaves and sounded kind of like footsteps which were getting closer and then he heard this sort of growling type noise, oh. not like a dog, not like a dog, he said it wasn't a growl like a dog, he said it was almost like a, a breath and growling at the same time. Mm. And when he turned round, this thing was just a couple of feet behind him, and oh. he just threw his arms in the air and shouted, wah, mm. and this thing turned and, and ran, and he said it was a, a panther. Oh. Anyway, when he, he got his wife to come and pick him up, he was he wouldn't come out from under the bridge where the lights were um, until his wife came and um, she took him, got him back home and he was shaking and, mm. and uh, he said it was a panther and she said, well, what did it sound like? And he told her and she looked on the internet and found a sound of a black panther growling mm. or breathing and she played that to him and he said, that's exactly what I heard. Mm. Now, I've got, I've got no reason at all to doubt him. Yeah. Not, like the guy who's not the type to to sort of uh, come out with anything like that. And mm. he, he certainly said to me, well, look, he says, whatever this thing was, you know, I think it, it it was by the river, you know, it was, uh, it had probably got some territory by the river. So yes. he was convinced it was a real flat cat. Um, uh, what else can I tell you about that, really? I, I don't know, but he, he yeah. did say, well, he was quite willing for me to, to pass on the information to you because he wanted it recorded. And his, his evidence would be good enough in court if he witnessed a crime. So yeah, if, when yeah, he's telling me that yeah. he's seen a Black Panther, like you, there are, there are other farmers who've reported it down there on the yeah. chase. 
lots of animal mutilations, missing pets, missing cats. Deer population has been added to a number of times in the chase because it gets eradicated and then they bring new deer in. So something's yeah. feeding down there. Yeah, well, as I say, I, I grew up on the chase, played in the chase as a kid. Um, and back in the 90s when the group was formed, we used to hold sky watches on the kind of chase. Mm. So I know kind of chase at the back of my hand and the good places to go and spots, you know, where it's going to be, you're going to be left alone, it's dark and, and everything else. And mm. the only thing that I've actually encountered was sort of five o'clock one morning, sort of hearing a, a noise behind a bush and then suddenly seeing two antlers mm. appear above the bush just sort of three feet away from me and that's unnerving. Yes. <laughs> and I knew first. I was looking at one another. Yeah. Wow. The stag, the stag ran, and not me. So, you know, I think if I was to meet a black panther, I'd be thinking, right, okay, here we go. Is it for real or is it, yeah. is it something else? But I certainly wouldn't... Uh, run from a UFO or, or anything of that nature. I think I've had too much involvement in it to, to not want to know exactly what's yes. going on. You, yeah. you like me, you're searching for answers still, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. 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 I think I've got a few, but uh, certainly people who have been out with on Skywatchers want to see something. And I said, be careful what you wish for, for. because if something does appear, I can guarantee where you'll be going. I said, <laughs> You know, I'll be standing here, I'll suddenly be left in a cloud of smoke and everybody else running in all directions. But, yeah. uh, it's just, um, it's yeah. a lifetime of it for you, isn't it, when you think about it? It's just, you've done a lifetime of work on the subject, investigating, researching, contacting witnesses, you know, yeah. sharing these... Well, it... I've, had, I've had some very good ones, which, you know, I, there was two girls, um, and it turned out that, the only reason it came to my attention was that the mother was a mobile hairdresser and who was doing my wife's hair and she mm. and they got talking about or well, she started talking about UFOs and anyway she said my wife said oh you need to talk to my husband about that anyway she told me that her, her daughter had been out with a friend um, and come back in the early hours of the morning. So mm. I was been to the nightclub and dropped off by a taxi um, in between the two homes. And this, again, was Etching Hill. Mm. Um, if you want to look on a map, you'll find Etching Hill. Yeah. And you'll find a, a smaller hill, which is another sandstone hill called Mole Hill. So they're still connected, the same strata of yes. sandstone. Anyway, uh, she said her daughter, uh, they stood talking for a few minutes, you know, before heading back mm. to one another's houses. Uh, anyway, they got sort of aware of this bright light above them mm. and they carried on talking. Oh, what's this light? And looked up and there was a triangular shaped object. They said an equilateral triangle yeah. above them, just hovering with no noise. Anyway, they both ran. Um, her daughter actually dropped a handbag, so she lost the handbag, oh. uh, ran home. Anyway, this was close to Mole Hill. Uh, so she hadn't got far to go, and she banged on the door, and her dad got up and let her in. Said, why haven't you got the door with the key? So well, I've lost my handbag. And uh. and she said, there's a, there's a light, there's something landed on Mole Hill. Anyway. My dad says, well, what are you on about? Have you, have, have you been drinking? Yeah. She said, no, it's still there. Anyway, they went upstairs and her and her mum and dad looked out the window and there was a triangular object on Mole Hill which had come down to ground level. Wow. Anyway, it then shot off. Anyway, she said her daughter won't go out the house now at night mm. at all. She'd not been out since that date. Anyway, I said, well, she says, you can go there now. The marks are still there on Mole Hill. Wow. That was years after. <gasps> and I went, and there was three distinct, perfect rings in the form of a triangle, one on each corner of a triangle. Oh, my Mole goodness. Hill. So you can estimate the size, but it was about yeah. 30 feet. 30 feet in each um, sort of line. And so I got a photograph of that. So that was, that was another interesting one. So... I think you guess you can guess here where I'm going from. 
I've been more interested in these triangular yes. shades of cats, and there's been, like you said, 15,000 reports of black cats. Yeah. There's been hundreds, probably if not thousands, of reports of triangles, um, which are all in the loft. Mm. Right. I mean, it's, it, the idea that what you've researched to just go into oblivion and not be shared would be an absolute sin. You know, all of that information that you've given me today is just, wow, I didn't know any of it. And I've worked the case, oh, Chase, like you, for yeah. such a long time. And I'm in a lucky position. People contact me and say, Deb, this article's come out about the chase or, you know, this happened to me at the chase. But it also validates my other witnesses who will say, I saw a black cat on the chase and nobody believes me. You get a lot of people go up there at night and sky watch because it's a great place to sky watch from. And there are yeah. lots of reports of lights. I've got videos of like silver cylindrical, well, completely, cind I'd say like a metal ball, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the lad yeah. just filmed from his back garden, watched it for ages. No interest yeah. in it for anyone in the, in the UFO community. I got in touch with as many people as I could. Just didn't seem to be that interested, in all honesty, which yeah. is just an absolute shame. Yeah, well, I've got another report, which was from the, the local RSPB group. Mm. And, of course, in the, the evenings in the summer, they go on to the chase to yeah. claw, twitch, you know, yeah, they, 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 for night jars. Mm. So, you know, I think the, to, to catch a night jar at night on the kind of chase is, is, some, is a big thing yes. for them. Anyway, they'd gone on to the kind of chase, so it was dusk. You know, at the time when you, you're likely to see the night jars and, yeah. and they come out and sing and ever sort of thing. And out of, the, out of the trees rose this orange ball of light. And they all sort of looked at it. Now, considering that they've got cameras, mm. none of them had the presence of mind Just to take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all, you know, yes, we saw this thing, you know. and. Mm. So there, you've got that one, you know, and you think, well, that's a multiple. Yes. One, and I've got another one from the Silver Jubilee, Queen Silver Jubilee. Now, at the time, they were lighting beacons up down mm. the country, and one of them was um, um, on the kind of chase. So people had gathered up by the glacial boulder yeah. to see the beacon, because they could see the beacon from there being mm. lit. And so there was quite a crowd of people at the glacial boulder mm. and they were looking towards the beacon waiting for, for it to be lit and stuff and up rose this um, silver disc shaped object from mm. the can of chase now all those people there saw it got, got the report upstairs mm. now at the time i at that particular night i was celebrating the silver jubilee it was 1977 mm in Cannock Town Centre and they got Beacon Radio which is the local radio station for Wolverhampton in the town centre. Mm. So we were all sort of gathered and um, dancing and one thing or another and got girlfriends with us and mm. anyway so we saw what we thought was an air balloon or, or something or maybe a big balloon and I took that out saw it with dancing and, and all the rest. Anyway, the following day, Beacon Radio announced that this UFO had been over the can of chase and had been witnessed and so on, and this we recorded it off uh, Beacon Radio, or somebody sent it to us. Right. And that was from the, the Silver Jubilee. So not only did the people at Castle Ring see it, yes. it went over can of town centre. So, you know, I think you wouldn't have taken much notice of it, looking at it, seeing this silver thing above you, you'd probably just think it was the Goodyear airship or... Graham and I continue chatting, and unfortunately at this point in the interview we went into private conversation again. But I will be chatting with him again, don't worry about that. I of course asked Graham if he would join us again and continue our chat. Tonight it was just to cover some of the subjects that he's investigated, and of course I, like yourselves, would like to go into them a little bit more and get some more details from him, and he's happy to do that. If you have any questions you'd like to share with him, just pop a comment in the comments section or contact myself or Graham via the emails provided in the description. 
I'd like to thank Graham for taking the time out to sit down with me and let me interview him and for sharing the reports that he's managed to collect over the years. I will be back next week, of course, uh, same time, same day. So I hope you join me as I bring you even more wonderful cases from BBR Investigations. Good night, everyone. Thank you.